I've never, I've, I've, I've been alive for 57 years, been in church for 57 years, and never really had someone do this. It's interesting, these three series were really put together totally separate, and they seem to just bind together. And the thought I really want to have is, as we talked about for the past four or five weeks, you remember we talked about that how, how can we know that Jesus really is Lord? How can we know that he really is the Christ? I mean, walk in great confidence about that. We can know from the testimony of his birth, the testimony of his life, the testimony of his death. Then I talked about the testimony of his love and the testimony of his resurrection, that Jesus is absolutely King of kings and Lord of lords. And we shared last time this amazing thing when he was resurrected from the dead, which really sealed the deal, right? And all that other stuff mattered greatly. But if Jesus had never come from the grave, then it really would be for nothing, right? But he did come from the grave. And because he came from the grave, it's interesting that the first thing he does, he goes back to these, these closest confidants he had. Somehow I think people in their mind think the church was this gigantic church all over the world at that time. Actually, we believe that it was probably a, a hundred or so people actually that would call themselves Christians at the time of Jesus' death. Think about that for a minute. When he went back to heaven, it's like he, got, he shows up. How'd it go? Well, I reached 100, right? I had 12, and one of those was a rascal, right? He didn't, he didn't have this humongous success. There were not mega churches when Jesus left this earth. There was a few people huddled away, hiding because they were, did not have the courage during that time. And Jesus comes, and he shows his hands and his feet to them, convinces them that it's him and he's alive. He ascends to be with the Father. And the question is this, what happened with that group of people? What happened with that small little group of people that were hiding away? What happened? happened with Peter who had denied Jesus and Jesus took him outside as we talked about and, and kind of just restored him and said, look, we got to go forward. You got to go feed my sheep. What happened with these people that were closest to Jesus after he ascended to be with the Father? Well, that's what we want to talk about for the next few weeks. In Acts, we are really told a lot about how that works out. And I'll read for you a passage of Scripture that's ridiculously, uh, I think, familiar to everybody that's ever read the Word of God that gives us really the foundation of what the church really looks like, the New Testament church. And I'll go all the way back to verse 42 and read through verse 47 real quickly from Acts 2, these words. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, they were breaking bread from house to house and they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. I have preached from this passage of Scripture many times many sermons, but never this sermon. God gave me a different twist on this than he's ever given to me for this particular day. I have a confession to make before we go any further. When COVID first was appearing on the scene, COVID-19 to the point, y'all remember those first few weeks when it was kind of in the news and they were hinting around that maybe churches shouldn't meet. We were kind of not really paying attention to that as a church. And so I was telling people, praise God, we have this online ability. We've been doing that for years, and you knew how to tune into that. Please stay home and do whatever. And, and for those that weren't here, might not know this, the first week that happened, we had over 200 people here. <laughs> it was like, whoa, that's not really good. The next week, I really enforced, please stay home. You can stay online. I think the next week, we had 144 people here. That was still way, way, way too many. That's when they had mandated maybe 50 people be there. The next week, I'm like, please don't come. And we had the elders and their wives and the guys to run the cameras and less than 50 people here for those few weeks of that. And I've said this many times. I've only had one opportunity to actually do it once before that if no one else showed up, you know, you didn't have to come here today. I'm glad you did, but you didn't have to. And there could be a Sunday I would show up and I'd be the only one here. And if I was that, I would just preach the message I have. And only one time years ago when we had about 20 inches of snow when I was at First Baptist Church in McKaysville, we were on the radio live then. Our radio ministry here is recorded and it's edited and sent to the radio station. Back then we literally did it live. It was broadcast from our church. And so a gentleman in our church came with a four-wheel drive vehicle and drove me to the church. And the sound technician and me were the only people in the room in a sanctuary that would seat 700 people. I preached to the pews. That was not a whole lot of fun. I've jokingly said that I would preach to the, to the chairs if I had to, but let me just confess to you how difficult 
those weeks were. I believe God called me to the ministry. I know he called me to the ministry. And I think the main reason he called me is not because I love to preach or all that stuff. It's that I love people. I love people. Warts and all, I just love people. I believe God gave me a hunger and a thirst to help people. And I love doing that. If you've been around me for more than five minutes, you'll probably find out, well, he's not a very good preacher, but boy, he really does love people. I, I love people. And I cannot tell you how hard it's been even communicate with my pastor friends how tough this year has been. Because many of those churches are not meeting at all and have not met. At least we kind of got over the hump and we got over that. And, and some people have come back. Everybody hasn't come back, but eventually we'll all be back together again. But it has been unbelievably difficult to go through this. And I, I want to confess that I have prayed every day since this first started God, please work something good through this for your church. And here's what I prayed secretly. That many of us would, and I, I can say for myself it has happened, for many of us, I prayed that they would long and thirst to be back at church, that they would miss something that they didn't even realize how much of a value it had in their lives, that we took for granted before this, that, you know, hey, I can go to church today, and how difficult it was to say, I can't even go to church today, how hard that must have been for you too. But I, I prayed that people would be homesick for church, that they would realize that church had a greater value in their life than they ever even imagined. And I, I've had people come and testify to me that that's exactly what this has done for them. They've realized, you know, I took for granted that I could go to church or be a part of a small group or be at youth group or be at this or have my children taught by these amazing people in the back and how difficult that's been not being able to do that. It's been tough. I read an article a few weeks ago that really stunned me. It was a gentleman who had taken the time to go and interview in person different people who had ever been at war and had become prisoners of war. They asked them specific questions about what it was like to be maybe in a dungeon somewhere and, and beaten and, and threatened by their lives and, and all the mind games they would play with them, trying to draw out information from them that they needed maybe to help defeat the United States. And, and it was so interesting to read this article because the main question they asked was, what was the most difficult part about being a prisoner of war? And I would expect to hear back the beatings that I took or, or maybe the mind games they play with me or the tough times and the, the horrible living conditions and the lack of food and the lack of water and the lack of light and all those kinds of things. But amazingly, the number one reason they were given, the most difficult part of being a prisoner of war was isolation. Isolation. Being alone not being with their comrades in the army, maybe the ones they rub shoulders with and kind of getting through life together, that the most hard, harsh thing was not being beaten and the mind games, but it was just being alone. Can we be honest? It's tough sometimes to be alone. And, and you need to know this. This is a news flash for everyone here, breaking news for everybody. You were not designed to do this on your own. You were not designed to live your life on your own. You certainly were not designed by God to live the spiritual life on your own. You were designed for fellowship with others, with a community of believers. God designed the church, not man. It was God's idea all along. And God's idea to reach the whole world is not through televangelism. It has always been through local assemblies, just like this church. The word ecclesia is used often in the scriptures, but 99% of the time it is used to refer to a local ability of a group of people to get together and worship, just like this group. Yes, it talks about a universal church. There is one church. You need to know that. It's made up of all kinds of colors and creeds and denominations and non-denomination and all that kind of stuff. But ultimately when he talks about his church, he talks about little churches just like us. It's his plan to reach the world. And so you were designed for community. Now, we live in a world today that is a, it would be a really interesting study to see because every person who has ever lived or is living now or will ever live was designed that way for community, to be with other people to go along this journey in life. And it'd be interesting to study all the different other things people find to fill that void other than the church. You ever heard of gangs and things like that? Have you ever heard of bars and, and places to go, nightclubs? And there's all kinds of people that search to fill that void in their life with everything except the church. And by the way, none of those will ever fulfill you like the church. I date myself when I say things like this, and it's interesting to see the kids that maybe or may not even know about shows like the show Cheers. Y'all remember the show Cheers? 
based out of Boston. I actually looked it up. It's actually a bar there. It was designed afterwards. And it was an interesting thing that there are people, listen, there's people that get off work. Every day I try to leave about four o'clock. I like to leave around four o'clock. I usually get here about eight o'clock in the morning and I try to go home about four. Some days I don't get to do that. Some days it just doesn't work out. But I want you to know that I want to go straight home. I get hacked off and my wife sends a text that says, can you stop and get a gallon of milk? I want to go straight home home. My favorite place in the whole world is home. Home is not a house. It's not where I happen to live. It's just being with the people that I love the most. That's the place I love the most. It's just to be with them. And I want to go straight home. I don't want to stop and get gasoline for my car. I don't want to get gasoline for the lawnmower. I don't want to stop and get a few groceries. I will if I'm asked to do that, but I just want to go home. Home is my favorite place. Always has been, always will be, and it's not an address again. It's being with the people that I love the most. It wonder, it's, a, it's an odd thing to me that there are people that would rather stop at the bar on their way home than to go home. Or they'd rather go out and do something with their buddies instead of go home. It, it really amazes me there are people trying to fill the void of being with other believers and growing in Christ, and instead they search for it in every other avenue of life. Maybe it's just busyness. Maybe it's their hobbies. Maybe it's another group of people that don't have anything to do with the church. But it's interesting that this show was made about a group of people that their home was a bar. And we could all sing this song together, but you know the theme song. These were the words, making your way in the world today takes everything you've got. Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Wouldn't you like to just get away? Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. And they're always glad you came. You want to be where you can see our troubles are all the same. You want to be where everybody knows your name. Norm! You remember when Norman walk in? Norm! Everybody knew Norm, right? Now, I'm a really rare bird, and I'm not tooting my whistle or saying I'm somebody special, but by the age of 37 years old, I'd had the privilege of pastoring every size church, basically, that exists. They're called 100th percentile churches. Really, the last two churches that I pastored before this church were what you would call 100th percentile churches. In other words, they ran 1,000 or more people, basically, and there's this rare, they're very, very rare. There's not that many of them in the United States. I pastored a church before this church that had more people on staff than we have in this room right now. Can you imagine that? And here's what I learned in that, by the way. It's not for me. It's not for me. There came a point after three years that I went to the leadership and told them that because I do want to be in a place where I know your name and you know my name. You know where I live if you need to stop by and see me. You have my cell phone number. Every person in this room, if you don't have it, you haven't been paying attention because I'm the only pastor I've ever known that shares his cell phone number online and with everybody. I don't care. If you need me, I want you to call me. I, I went to a church when I was growing up. If I needed to see my pastor, I had to make an appointment, and that may be in the next couple of weeks that I'd get in to see him. The only time I ever did that in my entire life, it was two weeks before I could see him, and everything that I wanted to talk to him about, it all worked itself out before the two weeks. It's almost like, well, that ache went away. I don't really need to go to the doctor anymore, right? There's something special about being with a group of people that really do. And listen, I don't know all of you by name. I know most of you. But you've been around here a while. I promise you, I know I may have been to your house. I may know exactly where you live. I may know whether you like dogs or cats or cars or boats or what. If you hang around each other long enough, you'll get to know. I want to be a part of something like that. You know why? Because I was designed and you were designed to do life with others exclusively for Christians in a thing called the church. And so whether you like it or not, God designed you to be a part of a local church. Now there's a lot going on in our world today. You need to know there's a lot going on in the world today about that, and we're going to talk about that this morning. But ultimately, it's my prayer today, whether it's here or somewhere else, that you actually have a place called a church that you can call home. And it's home because it's the people you want to run and be with the most. It's the people you want to talk to. It's when something good happens in your life. They're the ones you want to share that with. It's when things are not going the way you wish they could. And you need some people to pray for you. You have some people you can talk to. You have someone you can call, someone you can talk to, someone you actually know actually cares about what's going on in your life. Everybody needs a place to call home. 
And so for the next few weeks, I want to talk to you about that and really tell the story through this group of people that were huddled away and didn't know what really to do. And Jesus comes along and restores them and encourages them and empowers them through his Holy Spirit to do something. He gives them those words, those great words, the last words he would speak on this earth. He gives them the great commission. says, go therefore and make disciples. And guess what they did? They did exactly what he said to do. And it's amazing what actually happened. And so after this time that they've huddled away, Jesus has ascended to be with the Father. They go out and they preach the gospel and they tell others about what Jesus had done. And it had to be a powerful thought in that time. Imagine if you could go to somebody today and say, I was with Jesus yesterday. Oh yeah, he was there. I touched his hands and I, I touched the places in his si side. I saw the place in his side. I, I got to be with Jesus. I know they buried him. Yeah, but three days later he was alive. And there's others that could tell you the story. But let me tell you something. I've been with Jesus must have been a powerful testimony. Now, we obviously know these things to be true. We have the power of the gospel and the power of the Bible to tell us these things. But how about a firsthand, I was with Jesus last week. Oh, just a while. Jesus had been alive in these people's lifetime, and they knew exactly who they're talking about. But it's powerful what happened. I shared this with you before, and I can't point to the exact statistics, but I was taught this in seminary, that for the 22 years following Jesus is walking on this earth, for those 22 years, the church grew four hundredfold. The Bible will tell you in the passage right before what I just read and right after this that as many as 5,000 people were joining the church on a daily basis. Think about that. That's all they were talking about and God was giving them success. And so what happened to this church and what should happen in our lives is what I want to talk about today. And so it talks, it's talking about a home. These people give us a word picture of what it was like to have a church home. So Let's walk through the outline. Number one, a true church home is a place that is grounded in the Word. Never been a greater day for this to be stated because there are a lot of churches today that are grounded on a lot of things, but they're not grounded on the Word. The Bible says in verse 42, we read a moment ago, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. Continually. It's all they talked about. There are churches today that I really believe they think that their job is to help you find a physical job in the world or help you with your self-esteem problems or to do this or do that. And those can be residual effects. But please hear me when I say this. The number one job of the local church is to make sure that people understand who Jesus is, that he, he saves their soul through what he did on the cross, and he's willing to save their soul if they would repent of their sin and turn to him. That's the number one thing we do. Everything else we do pales in comparison to the importance of of what the gospel teaches us, which is to help people understand their need for Christ and what Jesus has done for them and to grow them up in their knowledge of who he is. That's what the church is for. They were continually in the, in the doctrines. They were continually studying the word of God. The church must be absolutely I single on this. And so write these three things. Number one, the word of God must be the foundation of the church. It must be the foundation of the church. I should never stand in this pulpit and read some other book or read some other thing that says anything about anything. I need to, to spend my time in the Word. Here's what the Bible says, Matthew 7, 24. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Isaiah 40, verse 8 says this, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of God shall stand forever. In Luke chapter 6, verse 47 and 40, 48, everyone who hears or comes to me and hears these words and acts on them, I will show whom, whom they were like. They're like a man who built a house and dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when the floods occurred and the torrent burst against that house, it could not shake it because it had been built upon the rock. The absolute foundation of the church cannot be a person. It can't be a thing. It has to be the Word of God, which is Jesus made flesh. You can understand this. There are churches today that are built upon a personality, for example. There are ministries today that are built upon a personality. And whatever happens to that personality is where that thing's going. That is a really, really wretched place to be. The name on the outside shouldn't be anything about the person in the pulpit. Amen? Come on now. Because when that person dies or that person fails or that person whatever, it all goes down. This house is built upon a foundation that nothing can come against it, right? It's built on the foundation of the Word of God that will live and exist forever. It's taken a pounding over the years and it's not lost any of its power. 
The foundation of the church must be the Word of God. We built everything we do in this place upon the Word of God. It must be that case. Number two, the Word of God must be the focus of the church. The focus of the church. Listen to me. James chapter 1, verses 22 through 24. But prove yourselves to be doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For anyone who is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror. And once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of man he was. Be doers of the word. Listen to me. The focus is not just about let's study the word together and not do anything about it. True faith is when a person builds themselves on the foundation of God's Word and lives that by that Word. It helps drive every decision we make. I hope every day of your life as you think about the things that you choose to do or not to do, it is, it is bathed through the Word of God. How would God have me handle this situation? What would God have me say in this situation? How would God have me respond to my child or my wife or my work or my employer or whatever it may be? It should be the focus of your life. Listen to me. I read the Word of God every day of my life, and I do it for a reason, because I need that Word every day of my life to guide my life. I don't know how many times I've had a decision to make in life, and the Word of God's illuminated to me to say, this is what you should do. It is the guide for your life. It's the focus of your life. And then thirdly and finally, I like this Word. The Word of God must be the forerunner of the church the word forerunner, by the way, I drive a 19, or excuse me, a 2002 forerunner. And I, I, don't, I need to look when I go back out there because I think I'm fixing a turnover. Y'all ready for this? 300, how many cars can say this? 377,777 miles. I'm, so, I think on the way home today, it's going to click on that. I need to take a picture of that, right? Forerunners are great vehicles, but that's not what I'm talking about. The word forerunner is a really interesting word. I didn't even know this, and I drive one, right? It means to go before. The very first Bible I was given when I was about five years old, it's a red Bible. I've got it somewhere in a box somewhere. When you flip it open, the very first thing it says there is Psalm 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That's the first verse of scripture I ever memorized. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You get it? It goes before you. It's like a flashlight for life. We're walking in a very dark world. If you don't have the Word of God, you don't have anything to illuminate you and help you on the way to guide you as you go. A flashlight's a really good thing to have in the darkness. And so the Word of God must be the foundation, the focus, and the forerunner of the church. In the church home that you need to find needs to be built on that foundation. If it's not built on that foundation, go look elsewhere. You're at the wrong place. Number two, the true church, a true church home is a place committed to gathering for worship. I mentioned earlier this is a little bit of a controversial thing, but let me share what the Word of God says. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Look at verse 46. Day by day, you got that? Not week by week or month by month, but day by day, continuing in one mind in the temple and the breaking of bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, there's a big controversy in our world today. And there are people I like on both sides of the controversy, but I'll certainly share with you what I believe. Andy Stanley, for example, someone I very much respect and appreciate. North Point Community Church made a decision months ago. They're not going to have live worship until next year. I don't get that. I'll be honest with you. That's their decision to make. That's great. And then you have John MacArthur in California in the court system fighting against his state so that they can worship in person. And I very much respect that unbelievably. Pray for John MacArthur. Pray for Grace Community Church. It's an amazing thing they're doing. And so far, every time it goes to court, they've won so far. It's amazing. They've even revoked parking lots and things from them trying to take it away from them. Imagine in the United States of America, a local government coming out and saying, you cannot worship today. And let's be honest, go have all kinds of riots and do what you want to. No one's going to say a word to them. You can't go worship today. Have you seen these videos of these churches going to local parks to sing hymns to God and arresting them for singing hymns? Are we in the United States anymore? Please hear me when I say this. God designed you for community. He designed you to be a part of a local church. And the Bible says he designed us to get together in person. I believe in it. I'm okay if you want to wear a mask. That's cool. 
but let's get together. I'm okay with whatever you feel like you need to do. If you don't want to feel comfortable being here, please watch online. I'm okay with that. I'm good with that. But I don't think there's ever a day. I could not bring myself through all that to say I'm going to lock the doors. I'm not going to do it. And I never did. And we have people walk up to this church that go to Methodist churches in town. I'm just looking for a place to worship. Or could I possibly stand at that door and say, sorry, you can't come in today. I wasn't going to be that guy. And I'll never be that guy. And so the point is simply this. We were designed to get together. The Bible says they got together every single day. Can I be honest with you? I don't have a whole lot of friends. And the ones I do have are all probably in this room right now. I don't have a whole lot of friends outside the body of this church. You know why? Because we're together all the time. Some of you come even on Wednesday nights. Y'all do know on Wednesday nights we have Bible study here at the church. I teach a Bible study. And we have life point groups that meet. You can come on Wednesdays too. It's really cool if you can. Come on, we'd love to have you. It's great because I love just being with you. Miss Debbie, I love you. I appreciate your faithfulness. I can't wait to see you. You're one of those faithful people. When you come walk in, and sometimes you walk in, and you can tell the whole world's falling in on you that day, but it probably did you a world of good to come and hang out with a few friends in a cafe and love on each other and study the Word together and be encouraged and pray together. That's what we do, right? Listen to me. I love Andy Stanley. I think he's a genius. But you're not going to hear me say, oh, you know, we'll get together next. Uh-uh. No. And he tries to say, well, we can do things through Skype and we can do things through this. That's great. There is no substitution. There will never be substitution for being face to face with other believers. I promise you, there's nothing like it. And there never will be. God designed us for worship. And the Bible says that we should be longing for our times of gathering together. Number three, a true church home is a place that gladly is committed to the well-being of others. I love this. I love this. Look what it says in verse 42 again. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Listen to this, to breaking of bread and to prayer. Look what what it says in verse 44. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. In verse 46 says this, day by day continued with one mind in the temple. They were breaking bread from house to house and they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. Write three things down. Number one, they were committed to fellowship. They were committed to fellowship. I've got to be honest with you. These months that went by that we weren't able to get together, like we, it, it affected me. I've never been depressed in my life. I'm, pretty, I'm usually up on things, not down on things. I'm, I'm just naturally put together that way. But that's the closest I think I've ever been to what I would call depressed because I just love being with people. I can't imagine living this life on my own. I can't imagine going week by week without the church. I've never known what that's like, and I don't want to find out what that's like because I can't. It's been tough enough doing it with you. My heart breaks today that there are many, many people, most people in the United States, that don't know what it really is like to have a church home. They have no idea what they're missing. Every person that ever comes to our church seeking assistance, you need to know what I do with them. I I speak to everyone. I'm glad to do it. But the first conversation I have with them is not, we need a couple of nights in the hotel, or we need gas for our car, or we need some money for some food, or whatever it may be that they need. Before we talk about anything else, let's talk about Jesus. Where's Jesus in all this? Now, I'll never forget, it's happened a couple of times in, in 16 years. This is so funny. that People think, I, I, I don't always remember a name, but I never forget a face. And we've had people come to this church, and the last thing I say before they leave is this. We're glad to help you, but don't ever come back here and ask for assistance if you can't tell me where you're going to church. It's amazing. You'll meet people. They'll be honest and say, well, I've been, how long have you been in Cleveland? Five years. In five years, you've not found a church? Or they'll tell me the name of a church, and I'll pretend that I don't know the pastor's name, and they can't tell me the pastor's name, and I know they're lying to me. It's I always say at the end of it, even if they've lied to me, listen, it doesn't have to be Grace Point, but don't come back here ever again because you know what you need to be doing right now? You need to be talking to your pastor, not me, unless you come to church here. How awkward must it be to go and sit down with a pastor you do not know and ask for help when you could be going to your pastor at your church that you're contributing to and asking them? That would be a whole lot more comfortable, wouldn't it? And so it's happened two or three times. People walk through the door and they're, hey, yeah, we just really could use a... Where are you going to church? They forget that I don't forget a face. And I literally had to say this to one one time because they were kind of a jerk when they came in anyway. They walked in. You could tell they'd just been smoking a cigarette. You could smell their breath. I could smell alcohol in their breath. And they interrupted our conversation to answer a cell phone call. I was already kind of perturbed by that, right? They come back years later, and we helped them. 
Hey, where are you going to church? Well, I haven't found a church. I said, bye. This conversation's over. How would I be helping someone if I did not point them to where they need to be going, which is they need to find a body. Listen to me, you desperately, you don't know that you desperately need the people sitting around you. And I desperately need you too. And so the point is simply this. They were committed to fellowship. Listen to me. If I could not fellowship with other believers, just God, take me on home. I don't even want to be here if I can't do that. And you should hunger and thirst for that too. The people in this room are some of the greatest people you've ever met. You know that to be true. And how can we do it without each other? Number two, listen to me. I've preached somewhere between 5,500 and 6,000 times in my life. I can't figure it out exactly, but something like that. And y'all ready for this? This is my favorite point I've ever given in any of those sermons. <laughs> y'all ready to fill in this blank? They were committed, first of all, to fellowship. Y'all ready for this? They were committed to food. Food. Amen. Come on, somebody. They were committed to food. Look at verse 42. Y'all say it's not, uh, it's not uh, a biblical thing, but it is. It says they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Here it is. And to breaking of bread. Amen. In verse uh, 44. They had all things together and believed they were together and had all things in common. Then it says, uh, in verse 46, this day by day, continuing with one mind of the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. God's all about food. You know why? Because I think I can just simply say this. When there's food, there's usually fellowship in there. If you don't believe me, as soon as we're finished, they somebody pick the place. Let's go fellowship together over some food. Something really cool happens when you sit down over a meal, isn't it? Jesus, even his last supper with his disciples meant something. There was something happened in that moment. Listen to me. We need to be committed to that too. That's why I'm not saying that every time we get together, we need to have little Debbies and Cokes sitting out for people. But we need to routinely find ways to do this. It needs to be happening in your small group. There need to be families in this church that get together a apart from anything to do with the church because you're close to one another, fellowship together and just have a meal together. It happens all the time. There's something special about food. Number three, they were committed to fighting. I want you to write that down. Somebody said, what in the world are you talking about, Phil? When we started this church, I'll never forget saying this. There's been one time we had a time, I won't go into that long story to tell you that people said, you weren't kidding. I've lost count in my life in these 32 years as a pastor that I've gotten a conversation with someone, maybe I'm in some meeting somewhere, and they say, it always happens. Somebody, they find out I'm the pastor at the church at Grace Point. Somebody in the room is going to go, hey, I know somebody goes to your church, and sometimes they'll call a name I've never heard, but most of the time it's, yeah, I know them. They're great people. I'll never forget this day. I was with this, I was some kind of a civic meeting, and this guy goes, oh, yeah, I know such and such. He goes to your church, and I went, um, he said, he's a really great guy, and blah, 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 and and um, I was like, yeah, that's, that's, he, he's a pretty good guy. And then this guy right sit, sitting next to me on the other side, he goes, um, uh, does such and such go to your church? And I said, yeah, he does. He's a really outstanding guy. He's a deacon in our church. And the guy said, oh, he's a deacon? Really? You'd never know he's a deacon by the way he cusses at work and the way he you know, cheats on his wife. And I'm sitting there going, I don't really want to hear all this that I'm hearing right now. And I realized I had a guy in my church in a leadership position that's living a whole nother life when he's not at church. Everybody should have to be a pastor and have something like that told to you. It really discourages you. And so I said, you know what? I want to be a part of a church one day. And when I had the privilege to sit in my basement and write out basically what's our new members class, I designed it that way. I said, I want to be a part of a church. If someone ever to speak ill of somebody in your church, even perhaps even if they deserved it, that you would jack their jaw. That you, you know, you come to the rescue. And so the story goes like this. Hammond Hills Elementary School in, in uh, uh, North Augusta, South Carolina. I grew up in, church, uh, in churches and also in, in schools most of my life that, that there were blacks and whites, sometimes 50-50. My elementary school, there was just as many black kids as there, were, as there were white kids. And we played together. I invited them home to my house. It was probably not the thing to do in the ni late 1960s, but I did it anyway. And my parents certainly were okay with it. So one day I'm out in the playground playing. I'm, I think I was in the sixth grade. My younger brother Tom was in the fourth grade. We always went to school together. My older brother, Mike, is a year older than me. He was a little bit ahead of us. But I look across, and I see this boy on top of my little brother, Tom, just pounding him. I mean, beating him up. And I ran over there as fast as I could run over and tackled that guy and pulled him off of my brother. And I was up on top of him pounding him. 
You know why? Because that's my little brother. And you don't do that to my little brother. Now, I got in trouble real quick because as I'm pounding away, I noticed I'm surrounded by a bunch of people, none of which were white. And it was all people related to the boy that I was pounding on the ground. That ended pretty quick. The point is simply this. My little brother, Tom, is my flesh and blood. And if you want to pound on him, you got to pound on me too, right? Can I get an amen from anybody in the congregation? But Adam, no, you're my brother. You are. Debbie, you are my sister. Why shouldn't I feel that way about you too? And so I want to be a part of a church that somebody hears somebody saying, yeah, y'all tell you about that old Adam, no. Shut your mouth, you're talking about my brother. I want to be a, now, we pray this never comes. If you hear my heart, you are my brothers and sisters in Christ. I should want to go to war for you too. I hope that never happens. But if it does, I promise you, I'll jump in the fray. I'll get right in there amongst them if it means defending you. Don't you want to be a part of a church like that? Now listen to the way it plays out for this church. This is all happening right after Jesus has left the earth. This is the, the first church. These are the people we pattern ourselves after. And it's really cool. Look what it says in verse 45. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. I want to fight for my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I wish, I get emotional when I think about this. I wish, this is the one time I wish you could be the pastor of this church. If you could see what happens every single week in the life of this church that bears that verse of scripture out, it would amaze you. I can't even talk to you about some of them. But I have shared with you, I've lost count of how many automobiles people have brought to me and said, go give it to such and such because they need a car. I've lost count of how many times people brought checks as much as $1,500 one time somebody gave me a check to go pay somebody else's house payment. I can't tell you the times that we've bought groceries and furniture and, and places for people to stay in a hotel. I can't tell me doctor bills. We've taken up thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars from this body to help somebody else in this body that needed something done medically for them. We'll take care of it. I've lost count of how many phone calls I've gotten to say, Phil, go take care of this need and just let me know what it is and I'll pay for it at the end of that. I've lost count on those. There's a person every Christmas, they come up behind me like I don't know who they are, and they stick gift cards in my back pocket to the tune of thousands of dollars. They say, you know some people in this body that need help. You know people in this community need help. Go help them. I want to be a part of that church. That if I had a need, I know there's somebody going to step up and help me. Because you know what? I'm helping you right now, and maybe there'll come a day I need help, and you're going to be there for me. I, I've loved to reach down and pull people out of ditches, because one day I might be in the ditch, and they'll be there to pull me out. Willing to fight for somebody else. Give up something that I have so you can have. That's what the church is all about. I want to be a part of that church. That's my home. I want to brag on that church. I want to be a part of that body because God blesses people like that. They were committed to fighting. Let's, let's close this out. Number four, a true church home is a place filled with gratitude for their source of wisdom. Man, a church should be so thankful. I mean, do you realize what God has done for this church in even 16 years? I mean, 16 years ago, me and Jerry Stout, who's in Florida right now, went to a local bank here in town that we both banked at. And he wrote a check, and I wrote a check for my entire life savings. And we put it in the bank to start this church. It wasn't a whole lot of money. We have bought and sold, I think, somewhere north of $7 million worth of property in 16 years. And by the way, we only owe like right at $900,000 is all we owe on all that. God's taking care of us in incredible ways. We're on our third piece of property. We own nearly 14 acres of land and probably $4 million worth of buildings. Are you kidding me what God's done for us? He has seen us through thick and thin and hard. And just amazing what God, the church ought to be the most thankful people in the whole world just for what they have. Look what God's done. From just a small group of people. It wasn't a big, we didn't show up 200 people the first. There were 14 people that met. Somebody brought some donuts and coffee, and we had a little Bible study that in a few weeks somebody said, When are we going to meet on Sunday? And 16 years later, we're still doing it. God has met every need we've had, never failed us even one time. This church was seeing that, weren't they? 
They didn't own a building like we have. They didn't have the things they had. All they had was the gospel and a desire to tell other people about it. If we have found bread, here's where you can find bread too. And the church is adding daily. How exciting would that be? Every day, somebody else is coming to Christ. Every day, multitudes coming to Christ. And so the final thing is they were filled with gratitude for their source of wisdom. Verse 42, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread. Here it is. Don't miss it. And to prayer. Write a couple things down. Number one, they were driven to prayer. Driven to prayer. Am I the only one in the room that's willing to admit that there have been times in my life because of the, the strain of the moment or the, the challenge of the moment, I was driven to prayer? Not, a, you know, I could watch TV or I could get something to eat or I could search the internet or no, I, think, I think I'll pray. Have you ever been in a place when nothing else mattered except I got to get to God? I got to talk to God. I got to talk to my father. I wish I could tell you I lived there all the time, but I have been in that place many times in my life when nothing else mattered. It didn't matter if I ever ate another meal or ever saw the internet or ever drove another car. I've got to talk to daddy. I got to talk to my father. Have you ever been there? I mean, driven to prayer. These people, they saw what God was doing and it, it drove them to prayer. Oh, that we would live there more. All that we would live there more, all that we would be, be brokenhearted over the losses of our society and the, the, the mess that our world is in today, that it would drive us to prayer. Not, I think I'll pray today, but I can't breathe if I don't pray. I can imagine what those prayer meetings must have been like. I oh, mean, it wasn't a bunch of just, you know, God, thank you for this and thank you for that and be with the whole world and we'll see you tomorrow. Can you imagine the agony in their prayer and the the thankfulness in their prayer, they were driven to prayer. Number two, they were driven to praise. I love this. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who are being saved. I think sometimes we're more driven to prayer than we are to praise. I think we sometimes see God answer the prayer and forget to praise. And so I just wanted to start today by just talking about home. I hope you do have a home with a roof over your head and air conditioning and heat. We're going to need that heat here pretty soon. I hope to the men who are in this room, when you get off work, I hope you want to go home. Not to the bar, but you want to go home and be with the people that God's given you charge over and responsibility over. I know that sounds ridiculously old-fashioned, but it is my heart. But I have another home. I have another home, and I'm home right now. I've told people that I preach so much, I don't, I'm as comfortable standing here talking to you right now as I would be if I was watching the football game on TV. It's because, you know what, I'm at home. You're my family. And I love you with all my heart. And I want to just do what they did. It was simple, wasn't it? They stayed after God's word. I'm telling you what, it was the foundation of everything they did. It was all about what God has to say. That was the guide, right? They didn't miss that. Man, they wanted to fellowship together. They could not wait. Listen to me. If you're providentially hindered, you're on vacation, we don't expect to see you here. But if you're able to be here, we'd love to see you. If you don't feel comfortable coming right now, we get that. Watch online. We want you to be a part. We need each other. I long for those times. Listen to me. We love breaking bread together. We love fellowshipping together, hanging out together. That's important stuff, more than we even realize. But let's don't forget that the most important thing is God said in his word in the book of Mark, I do not wish that my house be a house of preaching. He never said, I want my house to be a house of miracles. He said, I want my house to be a house of prayer. That's why we do this thing called pray first. That's why we encourage you in your prayer life because more happens when we pray than we realize. The next few weeks, we're going to talk more about what happened with this church. But the first thing I believe that happened is they established a home, a place where people knew that there were people that cared for them, would do anything in the world for them, that would give up what they have so that I could have. 
how infectious that must have been, how attractive that must have been in a world where people didn't know what the next thing was going to happen. They knew there was some group of people, and it wasn't a big group of people, but a group of people that they could call their family and their home. I want to be a part of that church. I want to be a part of that kind of church, and I believe that I am and that you are. And if you've not become a part of this body, we want you to because you need a family. You were designed for community in a church like that church. Let's pray that we'll always model that and be that in this community. Father, we love you, we need you, and we thank you. 16 years ago, God, none of us knew what this would look like. There's people in this room this morning that were there 16 years ago. There's no way we could have known where you would take us, but by faith, God, we trusted you. And look, look how faithful you've been, God. I thank you, Lord, for the memories that are swimming around in my head right now and of many others that have been here for this journey where they have literally seen a picture of what we've studied today by people willing to do whatever it takes to take care of one another. The good, the bad, the strains, the struggles, the challenges, God, all of it has worked for your glory. And we are thankful. We do praise your holy name, God, today because of your faithfulness. And pray, Lord, that you would hold us close to your side and, and dictate the path that we take. That thy word would be a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path. That, God, we would hunger to be together. That we could not do without one another for very long before we just had to be together. That, God, you would find creative ways for us to spend more time together. That, God, that when we're together, that we would encourage one another, lift up one another, and be encouraged by others, Father, to the point that we would go from this place, Lord, to impact this world for your gospel. God, how could we have such a wonderful place like this and not want everybody we know to be a part of it? I pray, Lord, that we would go from this place today rededicated to help others find a home like we have found at Grace Point. Lord, I don't know what needs to happen in this moment. Maybe just someone needs to find an altar to say, God, thank you for letting me find this place. Or, God, I need you to help me, Lord, to be more faithful in sharing my faith. Or maybe it's someone here today that doesn't know Jesus. And listen to me, you can leave this place today knowing Christ is your Lord and Savior. The Bible says that there's three things that will happen in our lives for that to happen. Number one, we fall into conviction of sin. We don't need to be saved if we've never been convicted of our sin. If you feel in your heart right now a conviction that, that you know that you've done wrong, you know you fall short of his glory, that's the first step in being saved. The second thing that will happen is he'll convert you from your sin. And I pray today there will be someone maybe in this room that would call out to Christ even now and confess your sin to him, ask for his forgiveness, and ask him to save your heart and your soul. If you were to do that right now, I promise you, he would meet your need. And the final thing the Bible says is then you're baptized. The Bible gives a story of that, that we're convicted, we're converted, then we're baptized. And maybe there's someone here today. That you've been convicted, you've been converted, but you've never followed Christ in baptism. Maybe today's the day to make that public. If you pray to receive Christ recently or maybe in this moment, come and tell us. We want to share that with everyone this morning. God, we love you. This is your time. Thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you that we do have a home, Father that we feel like patterns what we see in the scriptures. Hold us, Father, in that place, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. We're so honored that you joined us today. I trust the message was an encouragement to you. Please stay connected with us through social media. It's there you can get updates on all that's going on here at the church and future events that we'll be having. If you'd like to give to this ministry so we can continue to bring this type of ministry to you, please go to gracepoint.church slash give. It's there you can make a donation so, again, we can continue to bring these messages to you. Remember to like and subscribe. We'd love for you to do that. That way, every time that we go live, you'll be notified. God bless you. We'll see you next Sunday.